Hey guys, welcome to a new video. Today, I am here with special guest Jennifer Niven. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Niven, and this is my book, All the Bright Places, which is my first young adult book. I'm very happy to be here. I'm trying to figure out this link. This is being difficult. Okay. <laughs> so, if you guys don't know, she is the author of All the Bright Places, like she said, and she is New York Times bestselling author, yeah. which congrats on that. That is awesome. Thank and you. Yeah. So we're going to jump right into questions. And then I have a game that we're going to play. And then we have, we're have going to answer some fan questions. And I hope you guys all enjoy this video, your live show thing. That, yeah. But also, thank you for 1,000 subscribers. That is crazy. I feel like I'm still... Am I black skin still? No, I see you. Why is this being weird? So, yeah. The first question that you probably get asked a lot is, what inspired you to write? Oh, I was inspired to write All the Bright Places um, by a boy I knew years ago. Um, and he was my boyfriend at the time. And I... I had never met anyone like him. He was um, he was really alive. He was the most alive person I've ever known. But at the same time, he really struggled with bipolar disorder, and I could just see um, how hard it was for him to just be in the world every single day. And knowing him left such an impact on me. I knew that I wanted to write about it one day. And um, two summers ago, I decided to try it for the. First time, sit down and actually do it. Well, it was like, it's an amazing story. So thank you for writing that. I love it. One of my top 2015 reads. Yay, thank you. <laughs> well, then the next question is, since I'm a young aspiring author, what is your advice for young authors who are aspiring to publish and write a novel? Um, my advice, I, I, I think one of the best I can say to aspiring writers is write the story you want to read. Um, every this is why um, All the Bright Places is my eighth book, but it's my first young adult book. And every single book I've written, um, if you look at them, they don't really make sense together. I've written nonfiction and adult fiction and young adult now and a memoir. But the thing that they all have in common is they're all books I really or stories I really wanted to read. So I wrote them. And um, I always tell young writers also to just believe in yourself. Don't doubt yourself. Writing as a business is tough, but just don't ever forget that it's play too. So much of writing is play. And just remember always why you're doing it, because you love doing it. And learn to love to edit too, because you'll need to edit. And be prepared to write garbage, because I know a lot of talented writers who don't ever get anything finished because they're so worried about it being perfect that they go back over it and over it. And there's no such thing as perfect. And as soon as you can kind of get that, you know, embrace that, it's, it frees you up to just write. And you can always go back and work on it. Yeah, editing is the one thing I dread every time I write a chapter. I'm like, can't look back, got to write the next chapter. Let's go, come on. Exactly. Exactly. I let myself go back and like read it if I want to the next day, but I won't let myself spend a lot of time on it and just move forward. You're friends with a lot of young adult, other young adult authors such as Nicola Yoon and Jasmine Wonka. If you could co-write a book with anyone, who would it be and why? Oh my gosh. I'd actually love to co-write a book with Nikki or with Jasmine. Um, but I think that if I could pick any, anyone, it would be David Levathan. Um, he's, he's probably 
Well, he's one of my favorite authors, and I actually did my first ever event for All the Right Places with David, and I was fangirling the whole time, because <laughs> I just, he's such a lovely person, as well as being an amazing writer, and I, I, we have a lot of fun, and I think that that would be an amazing experience. I would love to read that book. Like, I love his Everyday series. Like, amazing. he has the uh, other one coming out soon, right? Right, in August, another day. So, I would... I would love to see that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so you've written multiple books. Um, how long did it take you to write the first draft of All the Bright Places? Like, was it different and faster since you've already written a book, or was it different and longer since it was young adult? Um, it's a great question. And all of my books, really, it depends on the book in terms of how long they've taken to write. It's taken two years to write. One, it's taken three months to write another, and um, it just really depends on the book itself. I mean, they can even be in the same genre, but they will still want to be written differently or slightly differently. Um, All the Right Places, it's the fastest I've ever written a first draft. I actually wrote it in about six weeks. Um, now, it went through a lot of edits after that, so <laughs> it didn't just come out like, you know, it is right now, but um, it... I always say it's like it's a story I was carrying around with me for some time and I feel like once I actually sat down to write it it just kind of poured out of me you like doing any meaning mind of which question I should ask next. <laughs> what do you see yourself doing in 10 years writing <laughs> I see myself um, just continuing to write books I I love writing and it's it's one of the things I love to do most in this world. So I definitely want to continue to do that. Um, hopefully there'll be other movies of other books and that's always fun as well. Um, but just continuing to tell stories. So if you guys don't know, this is the cover of All the Bright Places. It is such a beautiful cover and under it is even more beautiful. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see this. Like, how much say did you have in your cover? The, the cover is it's interesting. I mean, having been through the process, you know, with other publishers before, um, they took a long time at Knopf Random House to get this cover, and they brought in all these different people to work on it, and they were, they were just, they put so much time and effort into it. So... I knew that that was happening and I was so anxious to see it, but it took months before I actually got to see the, the finished product or almost finished product. And the one that they finally showed me was um, just a little bit different from the final one, but really um, looks pretty much the same. And I, you have input, they welcome the input. At the same time on this one, I only needed, I, only, I think I only said one or two things but really, I was just blown away by it because it was, to me, so different and unusual, and I just was, um, it was perfect for the book itself. So I was like, yes. <laughs> Following up on that, did you know about, like, the details under the dust jacket, or was that, like, a surprise when you got your first copy? That was a total surprise. I did not know about it. I actually... Um, I think someone had put it on Instagram before I had actually even examined the book really, really closely. And I was just like, what, wait, what? And you know, there, there it is. And there's a little finch and a little violet. And it was just stunning. And I just, I love it, you know, like without the cover, I love it. It's just, I'm very, very pleased with it. It's probably my favorite. Don't tell my other books this. It's probably my favorite cover of all. I love this cover because it's like simple, but then it, like you can see the finch in the violet. Yeah. And like when I was at Walmart and I saw it for like, it was like release day. And I'm like, that just drew me in oh, because good. it was like so different, like with all the other young adult ones. Like it stands out, which I love. Um, which book are you most looking forward to being released by any author that has a book coming out? Oh my goodness. Um, that is a good question. I'm looking forward to um, The First Time She Drowned by Carrie Clutter. 
And that one comes out, I think, in March of 2016. Um, I was really excited about Another Day um, by David Levithan, um, but I was lucky enough to get a, a like sneak peek at it um, a couple months ago. It's amazing. So I was I was really excited about that one. And um, oh my gosh, there's so many. And now, of course, I'm drawing a blank on all of them. But one of the best things about doing what I do is that you get to read some some things early. And I just love that. You hear about a book, and you're like, oh, can I get a copy of that? I want to read it right now. I don't want to wait. What was your reaction to when you found out all the bright places made the New York Times bestsellers list? Oh. <laughs> I, um, I, this was like a week after it came out and I was in Georgia on tour because I left for my book tour the day after the book was released. So I was in Georgia, I was coming back from an event and luckily I was not driving. My fiance was driving instead because I was looking at my phone, I was checking my emails, it was very late, we're driving back to Atlanta from Athens, Georgia. And I got an email from my editor, and she you know, said, congratulations, you hit the list. And I started crying. I just burst into tears. And my fiance was like, what is happening? What is happening? And I couldn't speak. I was like, <laughs> I just cried and cried. And we had to pull over so I could actually just hold the phone out and show him and say so he could read it. And it was, it was just an amazing experience. And I think one reason is because um, my mom was also an author, and she was my best friend and my mentor, and she died unexpectedly last August. And so it just kind of hit me in that moment, just all that I'd gone through to write this book, and the fact that my mom was not there, and she just more than anyone believed in it, in the book. And so it was just this completely overwhelming experience. And it just, um, this week, went to number five. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has, and it's been since how many months it's been released and it's still on the New York Times bestsellers list, which I think is amazing and congratulations on it still being on the New York Times bestselling list for weeks or months. Thank you. It's Well, it's been on and off since then, but but it, we didn't expect it to go back on in summer and it went back on a few weeks ago and now it's number five. So I'm like, oh, I haven't been that high yet. It's amazing. Bouncing off the amazing news, how like how did it feel knowing that All the Bright Places was optioned for a movie? Like it was announced even before it was even released in March, I believe. It was and it had Elfin Hatch to the lead role. That's right. It it was amazing because we actually we um, the movie option happened last spring, so well before the book came out because the book came out in January. And Elle Fanning was attached as Violet by the end of the summer last year, um, which was so fantastic because not only is she this wonderful actress and she's so talented and she's such a lovely person, but she's who I pictured when I was writing the book. So I pictured her as Violet and no one knew that. She just happened to come to the project because she loved the book and no one knew until I told them. Um, so I, I was overwhelmed. It was kind of like with the New York Times news, it was just this kind of <laughs> almost otherworldly experience. Like you hope something like that might happen, but then when it does, you're you're like, oh, I can't breathe. You know, it's just it's been um, it's been really exciting. One thing I think that is really awesome that she's not only that you imagined her as the character is that Violet and Finch are both seventeen in the novel, and she's seventeen, which yeah. in the majority of young adult book to movie adaptations, you have like 30 year olds playing characters that are supposed to be 17. So I love how already in the early stages, it is already true to the book and I can't wait to watch it in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I, lo I love that she's age appropriate and we definitely want to bend she's age appropriate as well. So you also sold your foreign rights in 32 different foreign territories, correct? Or was it more? Or now. Yeah. So which of, which of the foreign covers is your favorite? Oh my gosh. Um, 
I love all of them. I love the UK version because it's it's similar to the North American version, but it's it's a little brighter. The cover's a little brighter, and the post-its are a little skewed, like they're just a little tilted. Um, but otherwise, it's the same. Um, I don't know. I think I really love the Brazilian cover, which is very different. Um, and I also love the Spanish cover. It's, um, it's pretty. It's just so like striking and simple. But every time one comes in, I'm just like, oh, this is my favorite. Oh, no, wait, this is my favorite. <laughs> well, I'm only in Spanish, too, but I kind of really like the cover of the Spanish version, so I'm kind of tempted to buy it at the same time, even though I won't understand most of it. <laughs> right. I do have a couple of readers who are buying all the different versions, even though they don't speak the languages or read the languages, and I think that's really cool. They're just collecting them. Like you have each of like do you have each one like on a little shelf or do you like stack them up or like what do you do with all your author copies? I have um I have this very long hallway outside my office and on I have just bookcases that go across the whole length of the wall and um I have everything just stacked up there about all the different versions and and we only have I think maybe seven or eight of the foreign translations are out so there's still a lot to go so I'm gonna have to make some more room that's always that's the challenge lately is trying to make more room for everything I just want them all but you know I'm kind of out of self space so. <laughs> that's the challenge right <laughs> so like moving on to the movie how was it like back to Elle? She was in Maleficent. You like we all saw her playing such strong characters in different movies. How like are you excited to see her portray your own character? Like you you imagined her as her. Like were you excited about that? Absolutely. I mean, I I just it's it's so you know just just seeing a movie version of one of your stories is so surreal and incredible anyway but then to have your character come to life as you envision her is just I mean I haven't seen that happen yet I've only you know I've met Elle twice now and she's so lovely and she loves that I pictured her as Violet I told her that the first time I met her and we did an event together in February here in Los Angeles and it was just so much fun and to hear her talk about what it is she loves about the story and why she wants to play this role um, is just really moving too, to see that she really cares about the story and she's really passionate about playing Violet. And so that, that just means a lot. And she's, as I said, she's so talented that I think she's going to be such a wonderful Violet. I'm so excited to see her because I also, when I read it, the news was already out because it was before the movie or before the book was released. Right. So. Even with your writing, I was able to envision her, which is some of the, one of the things I really loved about your book, was the opening scene when they're on the bell tower. Mm -hmm. I just had like, I was thinking of like the movie and I'm like, it's gonna look like this, I have a feeling, it's gonna look like this, I'm so excited. <laughs> so your writing is just amazing. Like, I was able to envision it. Oh good, thank you. I'm so glad. So everybody, like most of your fans are like, uh, like love Finch. You love Finch, obviously, because you wrote him. But is there like a certain aspect that the actor you want to play, like the actors are auditioning, that you want them to have to play Finch? Hmm. A certain characteristic. That's a great question, and no one has asked me that before. Um, I think whoever plays Finch has to be pretty fearless. I think that he's got to be, he's got to be charismatic, and he has to be able to play unpredictable because Finch is, because of the bipolar, he's all over the map, you know. And he's so when we meet him, he's very manic, and um, I think to be, you know to have someone who can play that and then also play the more sensitive, you know, side of Finch, and the. Um, part that, you know, is, as he calls it, the asleep, where he's slowing down because the depression is coming on. I mean, it's a, quite a range, especially, um, like, in that first scene, he's doing so much on the bell tower. He's thinking about 
killing himself, but he's also trying to save this girl and he's, you know, being charming and funny. And so there's a lot going on in him. So we definitely need someone who's age appropriate, who also has deep depth and uh, the, just the sensibility to play this, this character who is all over the place. I think there's gotta be this spark and I'm sure we'll find someone. If Violet and Finch were to go on to an extravagant vacation anywhere in the world, where do you think they would choose? Wow, that's an interesting question. Where would they choose? Um, I feel like, I feel like Violet would kind of want to go to California because she was from there and always kind of looking back west. But I think Finch would make them go someplace they hadn't been before, like Argentina or someplace colorful. Um, and I think of course they would see things that you know, are not the typical things to see. I think he would make sure they found the most out of the way kind of places to wander while they were there. So even if you went to Paris or someplace, it's more a traditional vacation place, I think that they would find the off the beaten tra track places to see. That's a great question. I'm gonna think about that more actually. Maybe a second book? <gasps> Ooh. Hmm. <laughs> if you were in the middle of a volcano and it was erupting, what four books would you save and why? Oh my god. Um, <laughs> I love this question. What four books would I save? I would save... Um, I'd save Speak by Lori Hall Sanderson because I think it's done so much good for people who have read it. And same with Wonder by R.J. Palacio. I would save that one because um, the message is just so important. Um, and then I think I would save To Kill a Mockingbird because it's one of my favorite books. And I would probably also save, oh gosh, there's so many. Um, Maybe The Little Prince, just because I like the message in that one, too. And if there are only four books that I can save for the world, I think that, you know, I'm trying to pick ones that have messages we can all relate to in some way. There's so many, though. <laughs> I just planted my question. This is bad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, if you saw one of your favorite authors in the train, what would you say to them and like who would it be on the train yes or like at a book event or like you ran into them well luckily i've been getting to do that a lot which is really really fun and mostly what i just say is oh my god i can't believe i'm meeting you and i love your book i'm a huge fan of your work and this is just amazing i feel like cinderella um but I think I would probably just be doing something like that. Like, oh my God. Well, the thing I said to David Levithon the first time I met him was, oh my God, you're David Levithon. <laughs> and he was like, yes, yes I am. Um, so I think, you know, I would love to meet, there's so many authors I would love to meet who are no longer here, like the Bronte sisters or Ernest Hemingway. Um, Flannery O'Connor was my favorite. And I think I would just want to say thank you so much for all the inspiration. So if I'm correct, that is a supernatural cutout behind you, correct? Yes, it is. Let's see. That is that is Sam Winchester over my shoulder. Now the first, like, I got him for my birthday. He was birthday present. And the first couple of weeks, he scared me to death every time I came into my office or every time I looked up because I normally I work facing him and I would look up and I thought some very tall man was in my office and it just startled me over and over again I'm more used to him now though so if one of your one of your characters from all the bright places which one do you think would survive the, mo the longest in Supernatural oh that's a great question 
I'm thinking, hmm. I'm thinking maybe, I was about to say Amanda Monk because she's crafty, but I'm thinking actually maybe Finch's sister, Decca, because she's a little pistol. So I think, and she's really kind of unperturbed by most things. So I'm kind of thinking Decca might survive pretty well. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> that one. <laughs> if there was, like all, most authors have a certain scene or a certain part that they feel like years later, if they can go back and change it, they would. What is a part or a certain line or scene that you would want to change in all the right places? Hmm. That one, that's a good question too. No, I don't know about, about changing anything except I, um, I went to Indiana in April, and I grew up in Indiana, which is one reason I set the book there. And when I was there in April, I went with the film's director and the producers and my agent, and we traveled all around looking at all of the different spots where Finch and Violet wandered. But we also saw some other ones along the way, and I just thought, oh my gosh, I wish I put that one in or wish I put that one in I and mean, wasn't room, but there are a couple I wish I could have included as well. But, you know, ask me in a, like a year or two and I'll probably be like, I would change this line or that line. If you come to BE 2016, I'll ask you questions. Yeah, again. do that. That's perfect. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the fan questions. Okay. So the first one is from Tomatis 2001 on Instagram, and their question was, what was the hardest part of writing All the Bright Places? Probably the hardest part was just writing the more emotional scenes, because as I said, this was inspired by um, a boy I knew and by a story to some extent that I lived. So. Um, it was it was really emotional writing it. I had a, a young writer ask me, um, you know, how did you write it without crying? And I said, well, I actually did cry a lot when I was writing it. And I feel like you have to be able to do that um, in order for your readers to really feel the emotion that you're trying to convey. So um, that was probably the hardest thing, just writing some of the some of the sadder parts of the book were challenging. Definitely. So another question it was from Twitter is from Greg Andre 71. This might be a spoiler, so I'm going to like rephrase it. Do you always have the ending in mind? Because this has to do with a dual point of view. Mm -hmm. Like do you always know what the ending of the book would be? I did. Um, just because it's the ending that I experienced in real life. And so because of that, when I set out to write it, I just, I always knew how it would end. Um, even though, you know, there are so many different ways that I could have ended it, but um, that's the ending I knew. And that's what yeah. I want, the story I wanted to tell. So the next one is from Twitter again. It's from, what's, what's, uh, I'm, Sorry. Um, her name is Haley Hamilton. I can't read her Twitter handle. It's, how did you come up with the character names? Hmm. I came up, Finch was pretty, like he kind of came, I say out of the blue, but I'm sure Finch was inspired by To Kill a Mockingbird because it is one of my favorite books. Um, but when I was writing, I wrote his chapter first and just as it appears in the book and as I like was writing him on this bell tower, I heard the name, I, Theodore Finch, being of unsound mind. So the name kind of came out and I paused and I thought, oh yeah, I like that one. Um, and so I'm sure that the Finch part was inspired by Scout Finch and Atticus Finch. I have a cat named Scout Finch, so it's never far away from me. Um, and then Violet was a little trickier. I knew I wanted more of a classic 
like kind of a classic name for her that had not been used a ton. So I had to work more with the first name and I love the color purple. So Violet is one of the first ones I thought of. And then the last name I found because of an old silent movie actress who had that last name and I had been doing research on old Hollywood at the time for another book. So I think that's where that's where those came from. Finch was always, just as a side note, Finch was always easier for me to write. Violet I always struggled more with, even though I'm like her in some ways. And same with her name, same thing. His name came out much easier. Plot twist, he's a long, he's like a descendant of the Finch family. Plot twist. <laughs> oh. Interesting again. Okay, you're giving me so much good ideas and so many. Someone needs to write a fan fiction about this of him <laughs> in the world of the lost bird. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, this one's from I don't know Di Lovato. To what's your favorite Finch and Violet moment in the book? I think my favorite moment, I like the bell tower moment a lot, the one that opens the book. But I think my very favorite Finch and Violet moment is when he um, comes across the nursery when he's running and he gets her flowers and he takes them back to her and she says, and she brought me spring. And I, I think that's probably my favorite of all. It's probably one of the scenes I'm most excited about seeing in the film. You see, like, I'm, like, that scene and the, I, like, I love the opening scene because I love, like, all his inner dialogue that you put in there. Mm -hmm. There was this one line, like, I never, like, I never marked books, but I got, like, these the thingies. Like, I got more <laughs> notes from Target, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, I liked, it was on, it was, uh, I could just step off, I, it would be over in seconds, no more Theodore, Theodore Freak, no more hurt, no more, and no more anything. Can't speak today. <laughs> like, what made you want to come up with the nickname Theodore Freak? Like, what was like? How did you come up with that? I think just because I knew that because of all of the issues that he has, and the fact that he doesn't understand them, much less anyone else. No one else understands them. I knew that you know a lot of the kids in school, a lot of his classmates just didn't know how to read him or what to make of him because he's all over the map and so I knew that in a lot of ways they would think he was a freak and it just kind of again one of those things that kind of rolled out when I was writing um, and the fact that his last name begins with an F just made it more um, kind of flow. Uh, the next is from the same person I don't know the Lovato how many copies of All of the Bright Places do you own? <laughs> I, let's see, well, counting the foreign ones and the audio version, I probably, you know, they give you a quota from your publishing house. Um, and so, and I've given a lot of those away, but I probably have all told maybe, I don't know, 30 maybe? Uh, and a lot of book swag which I'm collecting because I love it. <laughs> what is one message you want the reader to get out of this story? That you are not alone and that no matter how dark things can be, there are always bright places to be found. The next one I have is when you're writing or reading, do you enjoy having like a drink or a snack while, or do you just, like it'll just distract you? Like what's your favorite to drink or eat? I, um, I, I have this like giant purple like water thing and I fill it up every day. So I have that on my desk. So it's boring, but that's, that's generally what I have on my desk. I try to, um, you know, not, eat too much at my desk because I do need to take breaks now and then and I start pretty early and I usually go pretty late so I'll like leave you know if I need a snack I'll go to the kitchen or I'll get you know something for lunch and 
go outside to walk to a smoothie place or something like that. My favorite snack is popcorn, but that's more of a like a treat at the end of the day or something like that because um, if popcorn is sitting on my desk, I'm just going to be eating the popcorn and then I'll have to go back to work. Couldn't do them both at the same time. So since All the Bright Places, All the Bright Places is becoming a movie and there's obviously going to be premieres all over the world, would you want it to be a red carpet or like a blue carpet or purple or like what color would you want it to be? Oh, that's such a good question. I, I think like a purple carpet would be kind of cool. Like a violet colored carpet would be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> good question. And this is the last question I have for you today. It is, who was your favorite character to, to write in All the Bright Places? That was from Cassie Rosie on Instagram. Um, I would say Finch was my favorite to write. I loved writing him. And I've written, you know, in other books, I've written first person uh, with other characters. And uh, I was, you know, a little hesitant at first because Finch was the first male character I've written from um, first person. But uh, his voice just came out, and he was so much fun to write. And he was challenging to write, too, but in a really good way. And as I said, Violet was a little trickier, so I just I loved writing Finch. I would write him all the time if I could. <laughs> Ooh, now we're on to our game of Would You Rather Book Edition. This ties into the book because we are using Post-it notes with the Would You Rathers. Because uh -huh. yeah. so, <laughs> would you rather write middle grade or young adult? Oh, young adult. But I think it would be fun to write middle grade too. But I, I love being a young adult. I feel like I'm at home. Following up on that, do you think there will be more? Will you be writing more young adult novels in the future? Yes, I'm actually spent today and this week working on the next one. So I am writing that one right now. Is that the one? Okay, I'm going to tell like, I was, I was going through interviews since I read All the Bright Places because I needed more. So I was going through all like, your L fanning and interviews and then all your interviews. Didn't you, uh, what was it? <laughs> You're writing another one that's about some guy, some kid that can't see anything, right? It's a it's a um, a boy who can't recognize faces, yeah. and a very visible girl who feels invisible. So, will this can you tell us it will be a dual point of view, like all the bright places? It is right. Just... It's interesting because I'm I'm planning for it to be, and it's certainly how I'm writing it right now. But again, the male character feels stronger to me. His voice feels stronger. So. I actually, today was like, do I make it from this point of view? But I'm still trying to work that out. But at the moment, it's both of them. I can't wait to read that. I hope it's like, I just want to read all your books. Like, I went to the library, and I'm like, do you have any other Jennifer Niven books? And they're like, no. And I'm like, order them all for me, please. Oh, the others. <laughs> Thank you. We'll make sure you get a copy of this next one. <laughs> would you rather have your favorite books become movies or TV shows? Oh, hmm. maybe TV shows because then you can watch them. Like there's much more to them. And I love television. So I probably TV because you could just like Pretty Little Liars has gone on forever. Like just, you just wouldn't have just one two hour experience. You could just go on and on. Okay, so this is like, I said I was going to be doing questions, but since you said that, what, you have Netflix. Mm -hmm. like, what is your favorite, what show did you most recently binge watch? Most recently, um, I'm actually <laughs> starting over on Supernatural, even though I've seen all of them. Um, but I just, let's see, I just finished watching um, Broadchurch, which is amazing. Um, 
and French, which I had never seen like all of, and that was really, really great. Yeah. Have Played. you ever watched The Fosters? Which one? The Fosters. No, I haven't, but I've wanted to. Is it good? It's so good. I, I, I've been, been watch, binge watching it for like three weeks now. I finished the whole first season in like a week. Oh my gosh. I have to watch it. Like, even though like a week is like slow for me, like, I binge watched Orange is the New Black season three in like four days. Oh my gosh, that's impressive. Yeah, I really have nothing else to do besides <laughs> Netflix and me. Which <laughs> one? Would you rather only read your top 20 favorite books or only read new books? Hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, I guess, I guess new books because, you know, then you continue to discover new worlds. Um, it's hard though to have that either or. I guess new ones. Like I barely reread books, so I would agree with you. But I mean, if I couldn't reread some of my favorite books, I'd be like, would I read it again? Right. Even if you just couldn't pick it up for a minute and just look at a passage you like or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just ripped this one. Oops. <laughs> Would you rather have dinner with Violet or Finch? Wow. I would say Finch because I am like Violet in some ways. So I think I think Finch. I just realized something. Hold on. Since we're talking about Finch. So on the cover, mm -hmm. there's like they're all perfectly on the are crumpled. But his is like peeling. Is that like purpose? Okay. You know, like for you know what happens, right? Like, yeah. Probably just a little different, and maybe so. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's interesting that it's just benches. I'm sure it's not accident. Mm. That's interesting. To see, I never really like thought about it in that way. Uh, when you just brought Finch, I'm like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> like the movie premiere, I'm like, if you guys come to Chicago, I'm going to bring like a bunch of post-it notes, and then I'm just going to hand it out to everybody. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Would you rather eat, read ebooks or physical books? Physical books, definitely. I, I just, I like holding them, and um, there's just nothing like an actual physical book, I think. So do you, re do you prefer reading, like, a hardback or a paperback? <sighs> Probably, I mean, I like the way hardbacks look better, but it's certainly just easier, you know, and friendlier to hold a paperback, um, especially if you're, like, traveling or something like that. But so it's kind of I'm always torn because I really like the way hardcovers look, especially on the shelf. But it is easier with paperbacks. Yeah, I like the paperbacks are so much easier to read. Mm -hmm. So like sometimes, like the Divergent series, I have I originally bought the paperback of Divergent, but then I recently got the hardback because it looks prettier on my shelf. Mm -hmm. But when I want to read it, I have the paperbacks. So it's like. So the whole, ju you're just supposed to buy all of them, apparently, like all the different versions. <laughs> That's pretty much what I'm going to do with all the right places. I'm going to get the Spanish version eventually, and then I'm going to buy the paperback when it's out. <laughs> it's going to be the whole show. <laughs> Yay! Would you rather be able to speak fluently every language in the world or be the best in the world at something of your choosing? Oh, wow. Um, I think being able to speak every language would be 
really cool. In some ways, you would be the best because you'd be doing that. I mean, I speak every single language, so I'll choose that one. Now speaking of, okay, I'm just going to keep asking questions every, after everyone. <laughs> so since we're talking about the language, how many of your foreign language copies can you read? Like, can you read any of them? No, it's so sad. Maybe a little bit of Spanish, um, but really, I can't read any of them. And one of my favorite questions that I get asked is if I translate all of them. People have actually asked me that before. And I want to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I read and speak hundreds of languages. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sadly just the, the UK version and the North American version. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, all, they're, all, like, they're the same story, just different words, sort of, I think. Yeah, like color has an O-U-R, you know? Um, yeah, so I, you know, once though, I apparently am going to be able to read and speak every language in the world that I'll be able to. <laughs> so this just came into my head, because I was, because I remember there was, you posted a picture on Instagram of you with a magazine and it had your book in it. It was like a different language. It was, uh, it was the gray one with the girl that's sideways. Mm -hmm, the Italian version. Yeah. How does, like, you've been in multiple magazines, your book has been recommended all over BookTube, and Zoella, one of my, like, one of my sister loves her, like, awesome. like, how has, like, all the attention all the right places has gotten so far, like, feel? It feels, it feels amazing, and it feels unreal, too. Um, I'm just, every single day, I'm so grateful for what the book is doing because I never lose sight of the fact that it began with this boy I loved and then me sitting down at the computer by myself and writing Theodore Finch and then suddenly it's it's all over the world now and all I wanted when I um, you know had finished the book all I wanted my hope for it was that it would reach the people it needed to reach the most and let them know they're not alone and let them know they matter and that there are bright places in the world. So the fact that it's doing that, I can't ever describe it. It's amazing. One thing I love is that you are very humble when it comes to like all the fame and all the success you've gotten so far with this book and that you still talk to your fan base because that's it's very large. It's sold multiple, many, many copies of your book, which I think is amazing. So, like, how does it feel having such a large fan base for your novel? It's, it's incredible, and thank you for saying that. It's just, it's, I never lose track of the fact that the book wouldn't be selling all of these copies without these readers. And I wrote it for these readers, so, of course I'm going to do all I can to acknowledge them. It just, it, it's so hard every single day, <laughs> the end of my day I say, I can't respond to everyone and I'm trying my best because I just don't want anyone to, you know, I want to respond to everybody and let them know that I see it. And I read every single email that comes to me on my website and I don't get to respond to every single one, but I'm trying to slowly make my way through. Um, and I just, you know, I read every direct message on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. I just don't get to respond like I'd hoped to to everyone, but I make sure I'm active on Twitter and Instagram so I can like and comment and, and things like that, at least interact that way. And yeah, I also love that because you use social media to connect with your followers. Like my friend Lily, she was like freaking out because I was interviewing you and she was freaking out because you followed her on, I think it was, it was Instagram, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, like, what's, like, I can't think of the question now. <laughs> um, with the social media atmosphere, the internet, how does that make you feel closer to your fan base? It's great because, you know, I've, I've come from the world of writing adult books, and a lot of my fans, I've, I've interacted with them before, but never to this extent because they tend to be an older audience um, and it's great because um, 
especially Instagram and Twitter, I'm really active there. I just, first of all, I enjoy it. I love Instagram. I love posting things. And um, I love the forum. And it's just, um, it's just really great to have that access to be able to talk to the actual people who are actually reading your book and hear their thoughts about it and hear what they like about it, what they didn't like about it and, and how they feel about, you know, Finch and Violet. And it's just, that's amazing because I think about all the writers in history who never ever got that kind of personal interaction with their readers and it's like sending it out into a void, you know, otherwise. And this is why we do what we do. And um, it's, it's fantastic to get to interact with them. Can I shake the head again? Can we have four more? Four more? Yeah. Would you rather read only standalones or tr series? I actually like standalones. I've, I've written a series before, and I've certainly read and enjoyed series before, but I really, because there's so much to read, and my reading time is so limited now, I just, I want to be able, like, I feel like I almost don't have time to invest in a series because there's so many things I want to read. Um, so I've, I've actually started recently just reading standalones. Doesn't mean I'll never read another series, but I think with time constraints, it's more practical for me. So since you're saying, like, since you said that, do you, like, listen to audiobooks like, when you're driving or when you're out to actually, catch up on your reading? You know, you think I would, but actually I don't. Um, I, I love audiobooks, um, but, you know, on the odd occasion I will, but I tend to, when I'm working, which is almost all the time I'm writing something, I make playlists for my books or whatever project I'm working on. And so when I'm driving, and I live in Los Angeles, so that happens a lot, I will listen to the playlist, or if I'm hiking, or you know, doing something where I'm not at my desk, I'll listen to the playlist because it's a really good way of staying in the book, in that world, and with those characters. And inevitably, I'll think of scenes and things like that when I'm driving around. So I, I do that more. But if I'm treating myself, then I'll get to listen to a book. So All the Right Places has an audiobook, right? Yes. Did you get to meet who was voicing Violet and Finch? I didn't, but they're fantastic. They did such a great job. And um, I also got to read my author's note and the acknowledgments on, so I got to do that on the audiobook, and that was, that was really exciting. That's so cool. Like, like, yeah, I like how you're so involved with the process as well, because some authors aren't, and you still stay true to who you are even while you have all these great opportunities. So I don't know where I was going with that, but thank you. Thank for... you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and then there were three. <laughs> would you rather read 20 pages a day or five books a week? So would I rather read 20 pages a day or five books a week? Yes. Um, five books a week. I'd love to have time to do that. That would be great. Yeah. It's only like three days to read a book sometimes. I'm so bad. If my friend, she speeds through books because she's such a fast reader and she's been reading for years. And yeah. I'm like, how do you do this? <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, now that I have a physical copy, I'm like, here, read this. Because she <laughs> loves she loved the Fault in Our Stars, and people said, if you love the Fault in Our Stars, you'll you should pick this book up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you need to read this. It is so good. Come on. Yay. <laughs> She's the only friend I'll lend a book out to. Like, I I just said, okay, finally, I'll let you let, borrow a book, but it needs to be in a plastic bag when it's in your backpack. <laughs> just to protect it. <laughs> I never get them back either when I when I loan them out. So I know, like when I loan them, I'm like, you may never see it again. You have to be willing to let it go. It's hard. Like when I give people out hardbacks, I take off the dust, dust jacket just in case. Oh, uh, that's a good idea. That's like, hard. if I don't get the book back, I'll at least have the dust jacket close enough. <laughs> that's that's good. I'm gonna start doing that. 
<laughs> Would you rather have your own personal library or unlimited book buying money? Oh my gosh. Hmm. It'd be awesome if you could have both because those would go really well together. But um, let's see, maybe my own personal library and then I could, I could share it with other people too. Um, and it's really fun to think about what it might look like or how big it would be. I'd like a really big one. And then I could share it with other people and they could come and enjoy books. So probably that one. We are down to the last one. May the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like Effie from the Hungarians doing this because I'm like picking out names. <laughs> Something I thought really cool was um that in the Hungarians movies because mm -hmm. you know they do several takes and then and then how she picks Primrose's name. The whole thing was of Primrose's name and then the other one was just P all Peter's name. So I thought that was like really funny. <laughs> No, last one is, would you rather shop at bookstores or online? Mm, bookstores. I like going to bookstores. I like being able to pick up the book and look at it and see if it really grabs me. I mean, I know I can read part of it online, but there's just nothing like, it's kind of like the physical books versus, you know, the ebooks. I would just rather go in there and have the whole experience. And online it's convenient, but you can't have that whole experience. Like I, I usually prefer ordering online since it is cheaper. But I like going to the bookstore, and there's this awesome indie pub indie um store by me. Well, it's not bad. It was like forty five minutes, but I still drive out there just for their signings. Mm. And then, like I like supporting them because like bookshops aren't as popular now. So I always encourage someone to go to a bookstore instead of ordering online, even though I. That's good. That's like, it's important, I think, to, and I try to do that too. I try, I mean, every now and then I'll have to order something online just because the sirens in the background, because um, you can't find it because it may be kind of obscure or an older, you know, print. But I, um, I just, I love supporting bookstores and I just love being in them. I'd live in one, I think, if I could. I love my Barnes and Noble. I got my Barnes and Noble. They don't allow loud people, but they allow you to lay on the floor, which I do sometimes. No, oh, that's good. I didn't know they do that. I have to like the one, by me, yeah, the one by me does. I'm like, you're awesome. Can I get a job? Can you work here, please? Seriously, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I would be paid for like, redoing every shelf. I do it at my own house over and over. <laughs> so that was everything. Uh, yeah, that was everything. That was amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show, my channel. Thank you for doing this interview. It was I probably will reread all of my places again. <laughs> I just th thank you for every single question and thanks to everyone who sent questions in. That was so much fun. And the questions were amazing. So. That's all I have for this live show. Once again, thank you for 1,000 subscribers. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for being on my channel. And we'll see if I'll do any more live shows with any other authors or Jennifer again, because that would be really fun. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Wait, how do I stop this? <laughs>